The teaching text for today is John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has plenty of room. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks, Ashley. You may have a seat. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. I'm just going to move this a little bit. You guys, I have a question right off the bat. Does anybody else pay attention to people's Instagram bio? Or is it just me? Yeah? Is anyone else just a little bit judgy when it comes to people's Instagram bio? Maybe I'm just calling myself out. It's okay. It's fine. It's a safe space. (laughs) What do I mean by this? If you have social media, this is not relevant just to Instagram. Usually any form of social media, right under your profile picture, your little handle, you have the bio, right? The 100, 200 character slot that basically says, here's why you should like me. Here's why you should follow me, right? Here's why I'm cool in a way. If you've ever read a blog post, the contributor will often have their bio at the bottom, right? All their accolades. What makes them qualified to to write this blog? If you've been on a dating app, your dating profile is kind of like a bio in one. Here's why you should like me, right? I'm using Instagram because that is my app of choice. And I, I just find bios really fascinating and funny. And I've mentioned I'm a little bit judgy when it comes to a bio. And I, in my own mind, you guys, in my own just time, I'm going to call myself out. I have this like inner classification system of how I judge bios. <laughs> I want to share like three of those classifications with you this morning. Um, before you freak out, this is nobody in this room. Don't worry. I feel like people are nervous. Like I'm about to pull out your Insta, pull out your Insta. Don't worry. That's just in my own private time. <laughs> no, I just Googled these and I want to just share just for fun. If you don't mind putting the first one, I kind of want to walk you through these different archetypes of Instagram bios to kind of paint a picture of what I'm talking about. The first one, again, I think these are all AI generated, so I'm not judging anyone. (laughs) I just Googled these. The first one, we've seen this, is what I would call the accolade-driven Instagram bio. It's like, let me fit everything that I've ever done and all that I am and all my certifications and all of my here's why you should follow me in one fail swoop, right? With matching emojis to correspond to them. It's a little Enneagram 3 coded, if you will, yeah? And I'm a wing 3, so I'm not hating. (laughs) If you can go to the second one, This second archetype is the pet parent, the pet parent. Are there any pet parents in the room? Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. I I don't even try to mess, like I respect you guys, but you guys, there is a different level when you're a pet parent and then when your pet has its own account, right? The pet account, the dog account, we don't mess with them. And I'm saying this as someone where one of my best friends has a dog Insta and a dog TikTok that has gone viral. So I respect it, it's just, a huge identity, right? It's like, I'm a dog mom or, or bunny. I've seen a lot of bunny mom accounts in, in Portland. I love bunnies. <laughs> okay, and if you can go to the third one, this is my favorite. This is just, again, to poke fun. This is like peak, I'm still living in Tumblr 2002 MySpace days. Let me, let me just read this to you. Sun-kissed soul, gypsy spirit, Finding peace in the whispered winds. Let's wander where the Wi-Fi is weak. Mm, Roni, he's a poet, right? This is just peak, like, Zanga. If you pulled up my Zanga from 2002, 2003. Anyone remember Zanga? Yeah, okay, yes. Anyways, <laughs> why do I share these with you? Again, this is just to be lighthearted, to poke some fun. The reason I'm sharing these, and you can take it off if you want, if it's distracting now, <laughs> is we have so many unique ident- indicators of identity, don't we? Instagram, a bio, is sort of a way where we can come and say, again, here's why you should follow me. Here's what makes me cool, in a way, right? We're all guilty of it. And I think it's really interesting paying attention, especially to our generation. I'm a millennial, so Gen Z and millennials, there is this really hefty weight on individuality, isn't there? Like, I want you to see me and know me and really know who I truly am inside. I think it's so fascinating. Pastor and author and friend to Imago Day, Joshua Ryan Butler, who's also been a friend of mine for many years, um, he recently wrote a book called The Party Crasher. And I highly recommend that book just for the political season we are weeks away from. Different sermon for a different day. However, he spends the first two, two chapters in this book talking about this. He talks about the different religious ideologies that we kind of adhere to. 
And the first is the religion of identity. I want to read this to you. He writes this. The religion of identity has a creed. Live your truth. Don't let anyone else tell you how to live your life. You are the one who crafts your identity. Rather than universal truths or morality, the focus is on discovering, cultivating, and constructing oneself. The sacred texts for this religion are TikTok and Instagram, where influencers provide a menu of available options for constructing one's own personal identity and brand. And this is like the oof-worthy moment, the mic drop. Those in this religion are tempted to quickly swap out their career choices, their hobbies, and even their spouses when they no longer serve the higher purpose of being a vehicle for constructing identity. Oof, right? Now, this is part of our human condition. Um, this constructing of an identity, I want you to see me, I want you to know me. I'm not saying at all it's all bad by any means. I'd like to just pause it. Isn't it exhausting, right? It's a little bit exhausting. I wonder for you guys watching this, listening to this, have you ever felt misunderstood? Have you ever felt put in a box or judged based on the identity that you've tried to present that maybe isn't tolerated or received? Been there. Identity's interesting, right? The last three weeks, we have been in this series called Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. That's based off of the verses that Ashley just beautifully read. And this morning as we continue, you're going to notice that we've been going extremely slow. Last week, Chris preached on three words, believe in God. This morning, I'm preaching essentially on four words, where Jesus continues that thought and says, believe also in me. Believe also in me. I want to like lay my cards out before you, church, and just kind of tell you, here's where we're headed. Here's what I want to challenge you with today. Here's what I've been praying you leave encouraged with today. And that is this. Believing in Jesus is not an optional add-on to your relationship with God. Amen? It is not an optional add-on. It's not just like a nice thing to have. Believing in Jesus is the linchpin that holds our entire structure of our faith together. And I would add to that belief in Jesus that trust and that faith in Jesus, when we start to walk in it, you and I begin to adopt a new identity in Jesus, right? That kind of surpasses all other identities that we would ever walk, walk in. Identity in Jesus, identity in Christ. How many of you heard this term before? Some of us, maybe. Okay, I grew up in prime youth group culture of the late 90s, early 2000s. This was a term that was thrown at me constantly. Um, and, I, and I loved it. And a fun fact about me, just to give you a window into to who I am, I love to write, and I have written, and I've kept every journal since I was probably about eight or nine years old. So that's probably my most valued possession are all of my stacks and stacks of journals. I love to write. Um, I'm a lot more of an emo girly than probably meets the eye. I just love sitting in my feels. And I really, really love mostly just seeing the places that God has brought me into and out of. And I love looking back. So more often than one would like to admit, I do go back and I read my, my old journals. And one thing um, that I've noticed in my high school journal specifically, when I was a teenager, kind of like 16 to 18, in the heaviness and angst, and, and all the, the, being a teenager is hard, is it not, right? In all those journal entries, I noticed kind of talking to myself as I would write, and I would just say to myself, Nassim, remember your identity in Christ. Remember who you are in Jesus. And I have these excerpts where I like go through the journal, and I see that written to myself over and over. Here's what's interesting. I read that now, at 35 almost, and I don't know if I fully grasp the weight of what that meant. Identity in Christ. And I wonder for you listening to this today, could identity in Christ have kind of become like a platitude, right? Like something that we say. We, we kind of believe it, we know it, but it's maybe something we say. And that is my hope today, church, is to take something that maybe has become like a platitude, identity in Christ, and to help us just see the actual power that it holds. The power that it holds for you and I sitting in this space today. What does identity in Christ mean? Okay, that's where we're going. I want to walk us through two considerations of this reality where Jesus says, believe also in me. The first is a question, what am I really being asked to believe, right? Maybe you're sitting here and you've read John 14 and you're like, okay, Jesus, yeah, believe also in me. What am I really being asked to believe here? That's the first thing we're going to tackle together this morning. The second is, what direction should that belief move me in, okay? That language is important. We'll get to that later. What direction should that belief move me in? 
I want to take us back to John 14. If you haven't listened to the last two sermons, I highly encourage you to go back and listen. But in case it's your first time joining us or listening to this, I want to set the framework for where we find ourselves in John 14. Chris did such a beautiful job alluding to this in in the first message. I just want to like double click into it. Where we find ourselves is what a lot of scholars call the final discourse, his last discourse of Jesus. Let me know if I need the handheld mic, you guys. I feel, am I okay? Okay, we're fine. Great. Let me know. This is the Last Supper. Jesus is breaking bread with his followers. And this is not a happy meal, right? This is like, I want you to imagine peak emotion for Jesus where someone's about to deny him. One of his followers is going to betray him. And there's a lot of disarray. Chris used the word despair in week one, if you remember, right? And in the midst of all that disarray and emotion, Jesus says something surprising. Don't fret. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. What does that mean? Right? I want to, there's something beautiful about scripture, you guys, especially the words of Jesus. There is a lot of what I would want to call like mining for treasure that the Holy Spirit invites us into. And so this morning, we're actually going to spend just a little bit of time camped out on this exact sentence. Believe in God. Believe also in me. There's something so powerful about looking at each word individually, looking at the verb tenses, looking at what the Greek means. As I was writing this sermon, this became the entire crux and the skeleton for my sermon. So I want to paint that picture for you right now. When we read this verse in our own English ears, we see the word believe listed twice, right? The interesting thing in the Greek is that this word believe, the verb, is actually in two different tenses. The first belief, where Jesus says, believe in God, is what we call the indicative tense. It's kind of like in 2024 years, Jesus is saying, yeah, that's the obvious. You believe in God, right? You'll notice if you have your Bible open, some cross-references or little footnotes will say you in front of it. It's like, yeah, you believe in God. That's apparent. The second believe in also in me is what we call the imperative. Jesus is giving us an invitation here. You believe in God Hey, here's an invitation. Believe also in me. I want to break believe in me where Jesus says even further, if you can put the Greek on the screen. If you look at this, the Greek for this, believe in me, is pistuete es eme. Eme means me, Jesus. I want us to look at pistuete es. The Greek pistuete comes from the root word pistis. Maybe you've heard it. Not only does it mean believe, but the actual weightiness of this definition is more like the word trust or allegiance to. Think about it. When I say believe in Jesus or pledge your allegiance to Jesus, doesn't the latter sound a little bit more hefty, right? Pledge your allegiance to Jesus. I want you to keep that in mind as we're going through this scripture. Jesus is saying, pledge your allegiance to me. Another word is fidelity towards. These are really, really heavy words and invitation, right? Pistuete. And then that second word, as. It simply means in, and guys, this was so convicting to me as I was writing this sermon. This really became just like the crux of my own conviction as I was writing. I was reading a commentary, and the scholars in the commentary were saying, not only does AS mean in, a more accurate translation for AS is into, indicating a direction or a movement towards, indicating a direction or a movement towards. And so that is, that is my question to us today, Church Imago Day. If you believe in Jesus— If your pistis, your allegiance is in him today, what direction is that belief moving you towards? Before we go there, let's tackle that first question. What am I being asked to believe? What am I being asked to believe when Jesus says, believe also in me? Well, Jesus is simply asking us to believe that he is Lord, right? To believe and to trust that he is Lord. I mentioned earlier, not just this optional add-on to our faith. We live in a unique time in society where... I, in my own conversations with people, I don't think people necessarily have a problem with saying you believe in God. I think most people nowadays would be like, oh yeah, I'm spiritual. All roads lead to God. You do your way, I do mine, right? I think most people's problem lies in Jesus, unfortunately. I think about for people who unfortunately have been taught wrongful teaching in the name of Jesus, right? That's where a lot of like church hurt and damage comes from. There's that bucket. I think of in my own extended family coming from a more Muslim agnostic background where to my family, it's just kind of feels blasphemous to say that Jesus is Lord. 
You know, a lot of my aunts and uncles are like, yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. We love him. Great example. How dare you say that he's God, though? He's like Muhammad. He's another prophet, right? Now, we know that Jesus, according to our faith tradition, is proclaiming to be God. I have a, I have a, um, a little screenshot, a little photo, um, sorry, not a photo, a slide behind me. This is just out of the Gospel of John. This is not an exhaustive list. These are just several verses where Jesus himself is proclaiming his deity. He's saying, I and the Lord are one. I am the begotten of God, right? We don't have time to go through all this now, but again, last week, Chris set a beautiful framework for the theology of the Trinity. He did the hard work, so we have that as our background, right? But again, if you want to take a screenshot of this, or I'm happy to send this to you, this is just in the Gospel of John, just a few instances where Jesus is claiming his deity. It's like C.S. Lewis says, many of you know this, this reminds me of my youth group days, Jesus' claim, because of that, he is either a liar, a lunatic, or... Lord? Yeah? Anyone? Okay. Liar, lunatic, or Lord, right? He's either crazy, he's either delusional, he is lying, or he actually is Lord. Paul Little is the author of a short book called Know What You Believe and Know Why You Believe. He writes this, Jesus began to identify himself as far more than a remarkable teacher or a prophet. He began to say clearly that he was a deity. He made his identity the focal point of his teaching. He claimed and demonstrated attributes that only God has. His authority, his miracles, his teaching, and his character were traits only true of God. Friends, this is what you and I are being asked to believe, right? Believe in God, believe also in me. We're being asked to believe that Jesus, whose name Emmanuel literally means God with us, is with us, right? That he is Lord. Now, what does that offer us, right? If you're sitting here and you're like, yeah, great, Nassim, I believe that. Yes, of course, I have no problem with that. What does that offer you and I? That offers us identity in Christ. In John 14, 20, Jesus continues just a few verses later. He says this, You will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. You are in me, and I am in you. I don't know about you guys. This language, and this continues in the Gospels, it becomes a little bit confusing, does it not? I in you, you in me, you're in me, right? It's a little bit of a web. Anyone else? Yeah? Okay. Are we awake? We good? Okay. So this is this, the second piece of what I, what I want to kind of talk about is identity in Christ, is I want to do my best to give you the clearest yet most robust understanding of what I believe identity in Christ means. When Jesus says, you are in me and I am in you, what does that look like tangibly for us today? And I want to teach out of a book that changed my walk with Jesus, and that is a book called Union with Christ by Rankin Wilborn. And we'll send this out as a resource later, so if you want, I can give it to you later. Union with Christ is a book that was written in 2016, and actually, Chris and I, our lead pastor, introduced me to it when we used to work together. This became a book that we went on to teach our our protege leadership cohort, two of which are actually here in the room right now from San Jose right now. This has become the most reread book in my Christian library to date, Union with Christ. Now, what this book does, it, it exactly talks about this John 14, 20. What does it mean that I'm in Christ? What does that mean that Christ is in me? That feels like a web. What does identity in Christ mean? And the whole crux of this book is another way of saying identity in Christ is that we're united with Christ. We're united with Christ. Rankin uses this beautiful imagery of an anchor and an engine to explain this point. I want to read you just a little bit of what he says, though. He starts with, like, the felt need, the problem. He writes this. Our neglect of union with Christ explains the gap between our faith and our lives. When the work of Christ for us becomes abstracted from the person of Christ in us, is it any wonder there's a chasm between our head and our heart or between our belief and our experience? Have you been there? Have you felt that gap before, right? What I believe in the person of Christ. And he continues, union with Christ tells you that Jesus' promises of living water are strong because he has joined his life to ours. Amen? He's joined his life to ours. You and I are united with Christ. I want to spend a few moments breaking down John 14, 20 to really kind of let it sink into us. That first piece of John 14, 20, Jesus says, you are in Christ. You are in Christ. He calls that our anchor. You are in Christ. The word Christian is listed three times in the Bible. Isn't it funny how we identify so much with that word, though, don't we? I'm a Christian. Are you a Christian? The phrase in Christ 
is found 165 times in Scripture. It makes me feel like that's how I want to be identifying, right? I'm in Christ. What does that mean? Very simply put, friends, you are in Christ. That is our anchor. Because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, you have been made right with God. You have been declared holy in Christ. Amen? We have access to God in Christ. We, it's almost like Christ is our representative, our mediator. It's no longer that God is just out here and we're over here, but Christ provides a bridge, right? Christ provides access to God and calls us son and daughter. There's so much beauty in that. It becomes, I love the language of anchor because we are like ships that are just kind of in really rocky waves, aren't we? But being in Christ becomes our anchor. A friend of mine, Zach Munoz, a seminarian, says this. I love this. He said it in passing, and I loved it so much that I made him sit down and transcribe what he said. I think it's so beautiful, and I was like, I'm using that in my sermon. He says, as God became one of us in Jesus, we witness the unity of the divine and the human. This act elevates our human nature. Not that we become divine, but Jesus represents us in a way that restores and redeems our identity and our dignity. Isn't that good news? As Jesus unites himself to us, it reveals a new identity, that he sees us in a way that we can't see ourselves, in that he calls us beloved son and beloved daughter of God, by the grace of God. This is being in Christ, church. This should get us excited. If you are sitting here in this room and you're in Christ, this should be like, we clap at this, right? This is good news. This is our new identity in Christ. This is our anchor point. And you know what the beautiful thing is? It doesn't stop there, right? The good news doesn't stop there. Not only are you in Christ, Christ is in you. He continues that thought, the engine. Christ is in you. It's almost like saying, yes, we have been saved from sin, right? We've been saved. And also, you and I have been saved for something too, right? You and I sitting here in these pews in 2024, we're not just in a holding pattern waiting for heaven, right? We're not waiting for the next life. You and I sit in this space holding intrinsic value and purpose and giftedness, right? We are on mission to become more like Jesus. That engine, that Christ in us, that Holy Spirit is what empowers us to do so. It reminds me of in 1 Corinthians, Paul's writing this letter, and he says, I'm writing this to those who've been sanctified and called to be saints. I love the both and. To those who've been sanctified and called to be saints. You have been made holy, you've been declared holy, and now you're empowered to be holy. That's the engine. And so my question that I asked you in the beginning, what direction is your belief moving you towards church? Maybe you're sitting here today and you have that anchor, but I want to know also that engine, what is the Holy Spirit doing in you? right? What, what direction is your belief in Jesus moving you towards? Our entire life is this walk with Jesus, right? And I wonder, is the Spirit leading you in a direction where you're more compassionate, where you're more forgiving, where you are advocating for the least of these, where you're fighting for racial justice and reconciliation, right? The list goes on and on and on. When you're being selfless, very simply put, is it leading you towards the cross, are you being reoriented? Bob mentioned that in our prayer time before this service. Just, God, reorient my heart. That's the question. How are you being reoriented? And the beautiful thing, church, that I want to really just like land home is you don't have to work for your identity, right? The work has been done for you. You are anchored. Christ has imputed his DNA into you. That is such good news. That's our anchor. And also, you have an invitation here today. And also, Christ gives us an invitation, believe also in me. That's not passive, it's active. Here and now, believe also in me. And that is beautiful, and that is good news, and that's exciting. And then sometimes we forget all about it, don't we? Yeah. We hear an amazing sermon, not this one, but you know, we hear a sermon on a Sunday, and then Monday happens, and life happens, and somebody bothers us, and someone betrays us, and we get bad news, and we go through tragedy, and union with Christ and identity just feels like a nice to have that a pastor preaches on on a Sunday. No? That's been my, my experience. Life is so constantly up and down. And I want to tell you this right here and now, that you will experience drift in your walk with Jesus. We all will. That reality will slowly start to fade. One of the final things in this book that I want to share with you is the same sentiment where the author talks about it like, expect the doldrums. Expect the doldrums. The doldrums back in the day were this nautical term that referred to when ships were out at sea, and according to the coordinates where they were at, they were most likely going to be shipwrecked and not able to be saved. 
In our modern lexicon today, a doldrum would be similar or synonymous to languishing or stagnation. I remember languishing was such a hot word during 2020, during the pandemic. We all feel like we're languishing. And my question to you this morning, church, is are you in this space and do you feel like you're stagnant? That's okay. Do you feel like God is distant? Do you feel like, yeah, this is all good news and I believe this, but God, I also don't really feel you. I feel like I'm languishing. I feel the doldrums. I'm going through something really hard right now. Here, I want to read one more quote from Wilborn, and this is something that challenged me a lot. It took me a few reads to accept it, because it's really challenging. He says this, the doldrums are an important and even necessary part of learning to abide in Christ. They protect us from the dangerous temptation of enthroning our experience of Christ over the real Christ. Waiting for the wind and being out of control forces us to let go of our cherished idol of instant gratification. Isn't that so good? We're not looking for just an experience. We are communing with the God who is always there. Amen? He's always there. Friends, the reality is that we all are going to drift. It's almost like we have to labor to keep union with Christ at the forefront, right? It actually makes me think back to me as a teenager writing in my journal. In a way, I have to do that even more now. Now that I get the weightiness of it, I have to still be telling myself, Nassim, remember your identity in Christ. Remember your identity in Christ. That's the same for us today. And the most beautiful encouragement and reminder that I would give you, church, if you're sitting here today and you're in that space of doldrums and languishing and stagnation and kind of in a space where you're like, I don't know if I can fully grasp this yet, I just want to encourage you to remain, to abide, to remain in Christ. One chapter later in John 15, I know many of you know this, I would say this is the most beautiful teaching of Jesus in Scripture. John 15 is where Jesus, before he dies, he gives us one final address and encouragement. Abide in me. Another word for abide is remain. Remain in me, and I in you. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Friends, abiding and remaining is not passive. It is very active. It is maintaining an active posture of reliance and dependence on God, right? Even when we can't feel him, the person of God kind of taking precedent over just my experience of what I feel God to be like, right? That is the beauty of our union with Christ. And I hadn't planned to end this way, but I'm going to. Um, just in my own quiet time with the Lord yesterday, as the Holy Spirit would do, as I was thinking about this sermon, I was reading Job, as one does on a Saturday morning, for fun, because I do do that. I love Job. And I was reading this chapter in Job that I, I hadn't, you know, when Scripture just pops out at you in a new way. I was praying about this sermon. I was just praying about things in my own life. And I came across Job 23. And if you know the story of Job, I would say he is someone who is living in doldrums, right, in this book and still so resolved in his identity in Christ, his identity in God. He was so resolved. And it was so beautiful. I was reading this, this, uh, uh, this part of Job 23, and I was just moved to tears as I was reading because it felt so relevant to us today, like how we would talk to God. And he's talking to God, and he's praying. It's before talk, God's talked back to him. And maybe you know this scripture where he says, I go to the east, and you're not there. I go to the west, and I don't see you. I look north, and I can't feel you. I go south, and I catch no glimpse of you. God, where are you? But he knows the way that I take. When he's tested me, I come forth as gold. My feet continue to follow in his footsteps. I keep to his way without turning aside. I think this is so beautiful because this is literally what it means to abide, is it not, church? Amidst the hardest of life circumstances remaining. He says, I'm not departing from the commands of your lips. I treasure the words that you say more than the bread that I eat. And the last thing he says is, even though I'm in darkness does not mean you've silenced me. How beautiful is that? Even though I'm walking in darkness does not mean you've silenced me. I'm not silenced by the darkness. Friends, why, why do I tell you this? Why is this hope filling for us today? I know that sounds really somber. Why is this true? Friends, the reality of union with Christ for you and I in this moment in 2024, er, er, right now in knowing Jesus, is the living Christ is ruling and reigning and interceding on your behalf right now. Amen? He is not just gone. He's not off in the distance. He has never departed from you and I. He lives to make intercession for you. The author of Hebrews writes this, he lives to make intercession for you. It's not just an optional add-on, as I mentioned earlier. It's not just like, yeah, let me just do this for you. No, he lives to make intercession for you. Some of you 
don't know why you're here today. And I would say you're here today because the living, ruling, reigning Christ is interceding on your behalf. And you somehow got here today. Some of you are walking through the toughest of life circumstances, and yet in the midst of that darkness and hardship, you somehow feel maybe a twinge of peace. And you're like, what is that? Peace that surpasses understanding, right? How is that true? The living, ruling, and reigning Christ is interceding on your behalf. Some of you are in a season of waiting, waiting for maybe deep desires for you or for your family, unanswered prayers. I want to encourage you with this. The living, ruling, and reigning Christ is interceding on your behalf. He has never departed from you. He has never left. He is present to you. Amen? That's who he is. And because of this, because of this reminder, because of this believe also in me that Jesus reminds us to, remind us to remember, part of our remembering happens not only in community, but it happens at this table. We take communion together as a church family every week for many reasons, but I would argue that one of those biggest reasons is to remember. When Jesus says, believe also in me, he is inviting you to actively remember what he's done on the cross for us. Amen? We can come to this table maybe without faith, and we can leave with faith. We can come to this table in despair, and it's almost like Holy Spirit's like, hey, you can trade it. Let me trade your sorrow for peace or for joy. That can coexist. Let me give you a little bit of me to leave with today, right? And I want that to hopefully be the posture that you come to this table with as we take communion. And I have two invitations for people in this room right now. I was praying about this all week, and I felt so burdened by this, and I felt even more confirmed in our worship service earlier, and as Chris mentioned, that, like, Jesus is up to something right now. He always is, but this specifically just felt like there's something more, and I want us to linger in the moment as we worship. And here are my two invitations. If I may be so bold, I think so. I've been here for a while, right? You guys like me. Just kidding. Um, If I may be so bold, I think that for some of us in this room, Maybe you don't have Jesus as your anchor. And today's the day to be like, I want to check myself. And I want to say yes to Jesus as my anchor, right? For some of us in this room, maybe your anchor has been different things. Maybe it's been striving and struggling and finding identity in all the other places that the world says, find identity in me. Find worth in me. Find value in me. And maybe today the invitation for you is like, wow, I'm in Jesus and Christ is in me. I want to say yes to that. I want to bask in the beauty of being anchored by that, right? Christ being in me. How powerful is that? I want to invite you, if that's you in this space, would you be bold and would you come to our prayer doors? Our pastors, myself, our prayer team would love to pray for you, to come alongside you. The second invitation is for those in the room where maybe you you know and have Christ as your anchor, but I would say maybe, maybe you need to yield to the Holy Spirit in a fresh way. I'll say it like that. I was going to make an engine metaphor, and I'm not good with, like, car stuff, so I'm just going to—I know I'm ruining a moment. It's okay. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. There's grace here. We're human. You know what I mean? Maybe for you, you need to yield to the Holy Spirit to move in a fresh way in your life. Maybe for you, you've kind of been halted or stagnated. You feel that languishing. You're in the doldrum season. And maybe you're like, God, I feel really distant from you. Like, I'm in this space. I got here. I don't know what I'm doing here. I need you to show up. The beautiful thing is you can put that back on God and we can expect big things from God, amen? And he does show up. And one of the biggest ways that he shows up is at this table as we remember him, as we cover each other in prayer, as we love each other, as we show up for each other. So as you think about that, I wanna just end in prayer and show you that painting one more time. This was the painting that Chris preached on week one and You guys, this painting has been extremely um, convicting to me the last few weeks as I've been reflecting on, on Jesus and John 14. I mentioned earlier Jesus probably felt a gamut of emotions in that space, right? I want you to, like, just look at him in this picture. I want you to think about the disarray in the room, the despair. I want you to think about each individual in that painting and the stories that they hold, the unique experiences, the unspoken things, the things swimming in their head and in their mind and their heart that no one even knows about, and then the chaos that you kind of see. 
The most convicting thing for me as I've been reflecting on this painting is not only was Jesus feeling sorrow, compassion, love, all these emotions, the biggest emotion that I feel when I look at that painting is knowing that Jesus was so resolved. He was so resolved. No matter how painful this moment was going to be, the betrayal, the denial, all that was going to happen, he was resolved. He was resolved to go through with dying, with being crucified, to make us right with God. Amen? That is the hope that we hold to today, church, that you and I, in Christ's resolveness, we can be resolved, right? We can be resolved when we come to this table. In a way, it's kind of like we can say, okay, God, I'm not going to let my heart be troubled. In your resoluteness, I can be resolved in knowing that you are good, knowing that you're present, knowing that I'm in you and you're in me. So Lord, yeah, we, we look to you in this moment. God, we yield to you, Holy Spirit, and I just pray as we come to this table, I pray that we would have a moment of remembering the weightiness of Jesus, you saying, Pistuete ASMA, believe also in me. And I pray for the people in this room who are going to come to know you for the first time, maybe today or this week, or finding a new anchor in you, Jesus. Would you be so close? Would you be so near? Would you draw our community to each other in this moment as we worship? God, I pray that you would do something fresh in us in this moment, Jesus. We expect that. And God, we thank you that your love for us is a fixed point. We don't have to strive for identity. We don't have to strive for worth. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for being our anchor and our engine, Jesus. And thank you for uniting us to you, God. And now we look to you as we remember. Amen.